This video is brought to you in part by SecondChanceGaming.com. They are a direct sponsor of me and this channel, and so if you want to indirectly support the channel while also buying or selling cards for your own matches, your own tournaments, your own duels, your own purposes, your own needs, then definitely check out their site and see what they have to offer you. I'm a big fan of how they do business, and their pricing and shipping from what I've seen and experienced thus far are both top notch. So definitely check out their site, which is linked in the description, and let them know that Phoenix sent you. But with that out of the way, let's get straight into the video. Hey, what's up guys? Phoenix here, and this video is going to be part 2 of my How to Play Magic Bullet series. I got a lot of positive, basically, feedback from you guys on the first part of this series, and if you have missed the first part of this series and are interested in going to watch it before you watch this one, then the link will be in the description down below, or you can always just go to my channel itself and find it amongst the recent uploads over there. But basically, I got a lot of positive feedback on love basically people that liked the concept of the series so I was like alright well we can continue doing this I didn't get the views that I was expecting to get out of that first video but I definitely got the engagement and a lot more of it than I was counting on for the views that it got like in terms of the feedback that I got and the people that were talking to me about things and the engagement and the like to dislike ratios and all that other bullshit that statistical bullshit that analytical bullshit that that video generated it was well above the margin of other videos that had the same watch times and same view counts so Jesus it's definitely something that I could continue doing in the future because I definitely would love to keep doing them in the future especially with other Code of the Duelist decks like World Chalice, Trickster, Vindreds, a bunch of archetypes that I really like the uh, the concept and the design of so we could definitely start doing that and look forward to some of those in the future but that's not what we're here about today. What we're here about today is for part two of the series on Magic Bullets, and this is going to be the deck building section of the theme of the series. And so, basically what you're going to see is you're going to see the ravings of a mad lunatic who is kind of decent at deck building, flying in blind with only a little bit of extra information given to him on how this deck is meant to be constructed. So, without wasting any more time, let us just jump straight into the deck building portion and get this done. So, what we have here is we have a blank slate. Now, when I first start building any archetype-based deck, I like to think on the mindset of what does Konami want me to do with these cards? And Konami is always a lunatic in terms of card design. And so, I can only assume that they want me to play a playset of every fucking card that they gave to the deck. Unless there's some built-in restriction that prevents me from doing so otherwise. So, now it's not going to stay like this by any stretch of the imagination. No, 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 no. Konami is definitely not the tastiest cookie in the box uh, when it comes to their card designs. So, what we're going to do here is we're going to start trimming down on things that seem like they're unnecessary. I'm not completely sold on Zamuel yet. Uh, it might be a one-of, not too sure. Uh, but, let's see. If it's a one-of, it's definitely going to be a really weird one-of. Uh, but Devil's Deal is a card that's probably okay as a two of as well because of how heavily searchable it is. Uh, and recurrable. I mean, Jesus Christ. Uh, and Doctor is just a card that seems like a two of, uh, if we're just, like, being real. Because, one, its stats are pretty tiny. Um, it doesn't, it, it gets beat out by the Kid and Caspar in terms of effects. I think that it's just better as a two of. Now, Star is definitely a three of. Star and Caspar are your best starting cards. Uh, and then we have Calamity, and then we have Zamiel. Now, next thing is, I don't care how big this deck gets, even if it goes over 40, there's definitely going to be an Upstart Goblin in this deck list, because this card is an engine piece. Activate it behind the monster you want the effect to activate of. Draw a new card, activate an effect. That seems pretty alright to me. Doesn't matter how big the deck is, it's an engine card. Uh, but, so carrying on, this deck has a problem with a normal summon, uh, being the main reliance of your thing, so... Naturally, I just kind of want to gravitate towards Brilliant Fusion to solve this problem. Um, two Garnets, just because you don't want to draw one and have your Brilliant Fusions be dead. Uh, if you don't draw both of, if you don't draw either of them, then I mean, I guess that's amazing. You have to activate two Brilliant Fusions in a game. Play two Seraph Knights because the extra deck in this deck doesn't seem like it's too tight either. Um, but like Brilliant Fusion implements a really cool potential play uh, that turns like Calamity into like a pseudo starter uh, in the fact of. It's well, especially since like Zamiel could still be in the deck, is that Brilliant Fusion, you can activate Brilliant Fusion, and since all these motherfuckers are light, you can send whichever one you want to the graveyard alongside Garnet to summon your Seraph Knight. And then on a new chain, because that's how these cards work, they form new chains after whatever card was activated in their column resolves. 
is if you activate Brilliant Fusion under a Calamity, you can send Zamiel or Caspar or any of these bitches to the graveyard. And then on a new chain after the Seraph Knight has been summoned, it can let you special summon whatever you sent to your graveyard, whether it be the Zamiel, Caspar, Star, Kid, Doctor, whatever. Uh, now, whether or not that makes it worth running, not sure. But we'll uh, we'll see how that goes. Now, what's the other card that can kind of really be good for this deck? Uh, there's a lot of level threes, and all the level threes are kind of broken. So, Ties of the Brethren seems like a, seems like an auto inclusion. Even though I don't really like it, I don't like it conceptually in this deck, just because it conflicts with the level fours. Because we don't have enough level fours uh, to make it useful. And as far as I'm aware, there's no other light level four fiend monsters that are decent outside of their own archetypes, because I think the only other, like, prominent light level 4 fiends in general are in the Fabled archetype. Uh, and those are all very, very specific towards Fabled, if I remember correctly. There's, like, uh, there's, like, Cruz, uh, Ashenval, I think it was a 4. I don't know. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to win any trivia contests, I'm trying to build a Yu-Gi-Oh deck. But, uh, so, Tides of the Brethren on... I mean, it only conflicts with Calamity, I guess, in theory, because Star, you can open with Star, activate any card in your deck, hopefully, in the same column as it, summon any of the level 3s out of your deck, probably going to be Caspar, and then you can Ties of the Brethren on the Caspar to summon Kid and Doctor, and then you're literally set. So, that might not be that big of an issue as I'm making it out to be. So, it seems like it might be, uh, might be a pretty good inclusion. Um, but... In order for there to be a high concentration of cards that trigger your things, Tune Table is definitely, definitely an inclusion, an includable card, uh, especially with Tune World as well. Now we play Tune World. We're gonna go for the wacky Tune World. Um, the the Tune World is literally a blank card that says pay a thousand life points and activate any one of your monster effects. Uh, I see people, I've seen people that have not played this card and they literally just play the Tune Tables. With nothing to search off them other than other tune tables. And I'm like, that seems kind of hokey. But, regardless, let's see. The more and more I'm looking at it, especially with these two, <laughs> just because it's two Garnet and two Seraph Knight, and I'm not fully sold on Zamiel either, I'm kind of questioning, especially since we're also running out of room. We have one, one spot left before we start going into the over 40 territory. And we don't want to go too far over that because that does impact consistency. Let's see. Zamiel can come out completely. I know it's supposed to be the intended boss monster of the deck, but it's just... It's not really a card that I'm too fond of. But, uh... Let's see. We'll take out these Brilliant Fusions as well. Maybe Double Summon is actually just more economical. Because Brilliant Fusion takes up the zone and stays there. And that could be a problem. Because if you're activating it behind something like Caspar or whatever, just to trigger the effect... That means that's locking you out from that card as long as that Brilliant Fusion stays on the field. So that's probably going to be something real. So let's let's just test with Double Summon before we uh, before we move up to the Brilliant Fusion nonsense. Because Double Summon might just be the card that's superior to Brilliant Fusion in this deck. Just because it leaves the field. <laughs> that might literally be it. it. Just because it leaves the field. Uh, but these need to go down hell. Uh, to get out of my spell and trap card zones. Let's see, Maxi. Why am I forgetting that card? That card is like an auto inclusion. That card won nationals single handedly. Uh, but if there's no Brilliant Fusion incense, then like, um, then Calamity seems like a two of at best. It might even be like a one of, honestly, because Doctor can keep adding it back. <laughs> so there might be that as well. Uh, but Star can summon it from deck. Doctor can add it back. It might be a one of. I don't know. Um, we will see how that one progresses. But, let's see here. What else do we have that we can work with? Well, more traps is always a solid option when I don't know what the fuck to do. So, uh, Solemn Strike. Let's see. Raigeki seems pretty good. Uh, I think that this deck would appreciate the ability to just be able to Raigeki a board and then do its plays. Could be kind of wrong, but at the same time, I don't think I am. Uh, and now we're at 40, a comfortable 40, but I think I want to push it a little bit higher. Um, well, let's see. Devil's Deal is a card that I never want to draw in multiples, so I either am going to cut it to one or I'm going to put a card in here that specifically, like, helps mitigate the chance that I could have access to multiples. 
And the only cards I know of that do that are really like the, the niche ass draw cards like Magic Planter. Um, which might be okay as a one of, honestly. If I was playing Magic Planter in Volcanics, which I was always playing that card in Volcanics for Blaze Accelerator Reload, then I feel like that we should be playing it here for this, especially since this gets a search. And this is a searchable card, so if you open it with Magic Planter, then you can just search it with Caspar. Um, yeah. I think I like this idea. Uh, I think I like this idea a lot. So that puts us at 41. Uh, the upstart is still going to stay in here because it's an engine card, like I've said uh, a few times already. Um, well, let's see, what else do we have that we could play? Uh, I really want to play some back row removal. And at the same time, I don't. <laughs> uh, the thing is, like, Death Parado only deals with face-up cards. So I guess we will play a pair of Cosmic Cyclones just for the precaution. Uh, just to see where it gets us. But as far as the main deck goes, I think I'm kind of okay with this. I'm going to gonna move these around for OCD's sake because I ooh, I need in fact I might cut Calamity 2-1 uh, because it's not a starter card it's literally only an extender um, and it's recurrable so yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna just take the take the immediate um, the immediate uh, action to cut the Calamity to 1 uh, well actually hold on I need to consider what cards out Masterpiece in this deck, because Never Endorphin doubles attacks. Which ones are the higher attackers? Let's see, Star doesn't get high enough. Calamity does. Kid does. Casper goes up to 24, it does not, and this goes to 28, it does not. Calamity is going back in as a 2 of, just for the fact that it outs Masterpiece with Never Endorphin. <laughs> I'm, I'm so upset that I have to build my deck like that, uh, but that is the Yu-Gi-Oh world that we live in, uh, where you have to respect things that happen. Uh, but so we'll play these. Uh, new. Upstart. Upstart. There. These are the these are the good turn one triggerables. Uh, and then there's these that are the, the broken cards. Uh, literally a row of the broken cards. And then there's the back of removal and then there's the traps. I'm very OCD with how I lay out my deck lists on, uh, on uh, these dueling platforms. But so now the extra deck I don't think is important. So I think we literally just throw in a bunch of generic rank fours and rank threes. So we're going to start with the Tried and True Utopia package. So Lightning, not too Lightning, Lightning Prime Utopia, and then I guess a Digesto Emerald. Uh, seems like it could be made one every, like, 100 games, and if that's something we're messing with, then we're messing with that. Uh, Tornado Dragon, uh, Castell, seems pretty alright. A 101, just because it's uh, got the protection effect from popping, uh, so sometimes that is very relevant. Um, so Castell, that, uh, I guess a Dweller, uh, now, let's see, Acid Golem, uh, we're playing the generic out Masterpiece cards, which also means we need to play Diamond Crab King, um, because that's a card that we can play alongside Utopia the Lightning, uh, and just make this. Diamond Crab King outs Masterpiece as well by becoming a 3k beater, so we're gonna mess with that. Uh, let's see, Break Sword is a good generic 3, as is Gram Pulse. If I can type, Grand Pulse. Uh, Fortune Tune is a good time card. So I guess we'll use that. Uh, Fortune Tune. Let's see. What else do we have access to? I guess we could play a Dante for the style points. And in, <laughs> in case we need a random niche ass 2500 beater, but Acid Golem isn't good enough? I don't know. Um, now, what's the last card I could play in here? I guess a Clutch Ass Cowboy? Uh, in which case, if we're playing a Cowboy. Probably cut the Don the Styly Dante and play a Gagaga Samurai. That that's generic, right? Yes, it is generic. Well, all right then. Seems pretty okay to me. Gagaga Samurai. This goes here. I'm organizing these from highest attack, from highest rank to lowest rank, and then when they're the same rank, it goes highest attack to lowest attack within the rank. But then if their attacks are the same, in uh, in the essence, in the form of uh, which ones? Uh, like Diamond Dyer, our Tornado Dragon, and Honor Arc, the one with the bigger defense value, <laughs> it goes first. Um, it's a very, very, very OCD styled uh, layout. Now, this is a 43 card deck. I really don't like this extra space being here, so I'm going to throw in one random final card 
that's going to have a lot of impact. And I feel like Dimensional Barrier is just that card. Um, so, god damn, I can't type. I can't type when I'm not looking at the keyboard. What if I missed up? Dimensional Barrier. There it is. Alright. So yeah, this will be a nice one of. Um, just to be used. The Magic Planter seems like it's a cool tech. I like that. Uh, and otherwise, I think this is just a sort of well-constructed uh, first attempt at the deck. So, the raving, Luna, the raving lunacy of me, the madman, has basically built this. Um, and this looks like the most boring cookie-cutter deck I think I've ever seen. Uh, I could be wrong. This could just be like next level. But this looks very boring and cookie-cutter. Uh, just because of like the thought process I went into this with. But, at the same time, that's the kind of things you should be going for. You should be going for optimization over style points if you're going for something uh, that you're trying to learn and one, be competitive with or win with and two, learn. So, I mean, it's, it's the, the less you give the deck the chance to make the mistakes for you, the, uh, the more you can actually make the mistakes yourself and then learn from them, essentially, is what I'm trying to say there. But anyway, that has been this part of this how-to series on how to play Magic Bullets. So, if you enjoyed my ranting and raving and lunacy and all that sort of nonsense and just, like, getting an, a more in-depth, like, like, look at the thought processes that literally go on through my head when I'm building a deck, especially one from scratch, then definitely definitely let me know how you felt about that and what you thought about this video in the comments down below. But like I already said, if you missed episode one of this series or portion one, then definitely check out the link in the description or just go to my channel and look for it if you want to see that. But otherwise, stay tuned for part three where we're going to be doing some gameplay with this deck that I just built here and seeing how it handles against different matchups. So unfortunately, Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro is not in link format yet. It does not have the link coding on it for Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro Percy, which is the only reliable Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro out there. So it's the only one that I really use uh, for like recording and all that sort of nonsense. It's the most reliable one that I found, so it's the one I only like to use. Um, and so that means I'm going to be playing in not link format, but still like decent decks. I'm going to be playing against decent shit, uh, hopefully. So we'll see how that goes. But anyway, let me know what your thoughts, questions, concerns, all that nonsense are in the comments down below. But other than that, as always, like and subscribe if you want to see more videos, more awesome Yu-Gi-Oh! content. And other than that, links are always in the description to my Facebook fan page as well as my personal Patreon page if you want to support the channel directly help contribute to my ability to continue making quality content for the channel and all that sort of stuff. If you want to go check out the reward tiers over there and consider contributing to one of them, then you would have my eternal gratitude if you did so. But other than that, thanks for watching as I've already said. Thanks for your time as usual. Hope you enjoyed this literal just nonsense of me building a deck on camera. I don't know. It was just an idea. I was going to roll with it. <laughs> but anyway, as I've already said, thanks for your time as usual, guys, and take care. I will see you in the next video.